the universe spin? Think about it. Planets spin. The sun spins. Galaxies spin. Even black holes spin. So what about the entire universe? And if it was spinning, could this help solve one of the biggest problems in astrophysics today, the crisis in cosmology, or what's known as the Hubble tension, where we have two main ways of measuring the current expansion rate of the universe, but the two values we get from those two different methods do not agree at all. Now this idea of the universe possibly spinning is not a new one, it's been around for a long time with scientists like Newton, Mach and Einstein all thinking about it as a possibility, but we've never been able to gather any evidence from observing the universe that could back up this idea that the universe itself spins. But this month, this paper by Zagetti and collaborators has revisited this idea and claimed a spinning universe could solve the Hubble tension. But just because this idea can solve that problem doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be the correct way to actually solve it. So in this video, we're going to do a deep dive into this. I'm going to start first with a quick recap on the crisis in cosmology, then chat about what Zagetti and collaborators have claimed in terms of the universe spinning and whether it can solve it, and finally chat about whether we can actually prove whether the universe is spinning or not. But before we dive into that, and speaking of spinning, Father's Day is coming up, maybe you're struggling to think of the perfect gift, and you might have noticed this absolute beauty on the desk or on the shelves behind me during my videos. This is a Novium hover pen, inspired by spacecrafts and engineered to defy gravity. They float in their docks using permanent magnets, so no electricity needed. Just look how cool this hover pen interstellar looks. Its tilt is 20 23 and a half degrees, which is a really nice nod to the Earth's axial tilt, which I love. Plus it comes in either space black, starlight silver, Mars magma, or Neptune blue. Or you can get a premium edition, which has a real meteorite shard embedded in it, which is older than the Earth itself, which let's face it, just makes us want one even more. They feel so premium and high end, and honestly, I think it's the perfect gift for the space nerd in your life, which could be you, you know? treat yourself. So if you use the link in the video description down below or scan the QR codes or use the code DrBecky at checkout, you'll get 10% off all of their hover pens with free international shipping available to most countries. Plus up until the 15th of May, they're running a Kickstarter campaign for the world's first pocket friendly hover pen, the Traverse, which allows you to take your hover pen on the go. And they have a limited Apollo edition, which contains an authentic Capton foil specimen from the Apollo 11 command model module Columbia. I'll pop a link to the Kickstarter campaign in the video description and if you decide to back it you'll get up to 30% off the standard Traverse hover pen or the limited Apollo edition. So thanks again to Novium for sponsoring this video and now let's start with a quick recap on the crisis in cosmology. So if you've been following me for a while you know that I have talked a lot about the Hubble tension, the crisis in cosmology on this channel and I'll link a playlist of videos that I've made in the video description down below if you want a real deep dive on this. But essentially what this is all about is is our measurements of the current expansion rate of the universe, what's known as the Hubble constant or H naught. The naught here is referring to the fact that it's the current rate of expansion around us in the universe today. Like what is the expansion rate now. Because the rate of expansion does change with time, we can investigate that with our telescopes and measure h as a function of redshift, and that's something that the recently launched Euclid Space Telescope will focus on, and it's what the DESI collaboration have done recently as well, with some interesting results that I've covered before that suggest the acceleration of the expansion rate may be changing with time, so dark energy. There's a whole other separate thing to what we're talking about now, which is the current expansion rate of the universe today, now. So one way to measure the current expansion rate is to measure both the distance to nearby galaxies and then the velocity that they appear to be moving away from us because of the expansion. We then plot those against each other and then the slope of this line is the current expansion rate h naught. When we do that, we get a value of around 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. 
The other way that we can do this is to model the entire universe. Starting with the earliest light ever given out in the universe, back from when the universe was just 380,000 years old. It's what's known as the cosmic microwave background. We then come up with a model that can evolve the cosmic microwave background into what we see in the universe around us today. We find the best fit model to the universe in terms of what it's made of, how much of everything there is, and all the laws of physics that we know of, and we can measure lots of different properties of the universe from this model, but one of those is the rate of expansion of the universe over time, and in particular, the current rate of expansion, h naught. When we do that, we get a value of 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. The tension or crisis is because there is such a huge difference between those two values that we get for the two different ways of doing this, either using supernova in nearby galaxies to get at their distances and measuring their velocities and plotting them on a graph, or using the cosmic microwave background. At first, they agreed. And that it's a gap which has only been widening over time as our uncertainties on our measurements decrease, as analysis techniques got better and better, and our observations of the universe supposedly improved due to bigger and better telescopes. So for that gap between them to be that much bigger than the uncertainties on our measurements, then either there's something wrong with our observations of nearby galaxies, perhaps how we're calculating their distances, perhaps they're inaccurate at the minute, and people have been using the James Webb Space Telescope to try and figure out if that is what's responsible. Or the other option is that there's something wrong with our best model of the universe. Either we're missing something in our laws of physics, or there's a component of the universe that we don't know about. If it was this second option, then we'd learn something new, some new physics. And so this is why people tend to get quite excited when the solutions raise that fall into this category. And it is into this category that the idea of a spinning universe falls, which brings me to part two. What Segetian collaborators have claimed about a spinning universe and how it can solve the crisis in cosmology. So as I said earlier, everything spins, and that's just simply because the gas clouds that collapse to make things like galaxies and stars and planets, they aren't symmetrical. And so those tiny little offsets mean that as gravity starts to clump together those gas clouds, you start to then build in this motion, which then builds into an overall momentum, specifically angular momentum, a spinning momentum, and then things start to have spinning velocities, what we call angular velocities. And the question has always been, is that true for the entire universe as well? In particular, the mathematician Kurt Gödel in 1949 found a solution to Einstein's general relativity equations for a universe that was spinning, what's known as the Gödel metric. I, in terms of the laws of gravity, like a spinning universe could happily exist, except for the fact that in his solutions, the universe that you get doesn't expand. So it's not realistic, it doesn't match what we've observed about the universe with our telescopes. But it was Gödel's solution that inspired Segetian collaborators to determine whether a spinning universe could be the thing we're missing to explain the Hubble tension. They said, let's just model the universe as a simple rotating fluid. But by doing that, you add in a little bit of a complication, because then you add in what's known as frame dragging, or the lens thurring effect. After Joseph Lenz and Hans Thuring predicted it in 1918, off the back of Einstein's theory of general relativity of gravity. So in general relativity, massive objects curve space. And then the effect of gravity mathematically is then explained by objects moving along that curved space. But if you add in the fact that the object is spinning, then you also end up with twisted space as well as curved space. We've even observed this happening for a white dwarf star that has a pulsar in orbit around it. The pulses of radio light from the pulsar were delayed due to the twist of space-time from the spinning of the white dwarf. Similarly, modeling the universe as a rotating fluid would change our estimate of the rate of expansion of the universe with distance away from us. 
So here is that in action on this figure from Zagetti and collaborators. So on the horizontal axis, you've got time, right, with the early universe on the left and then today on the right. The vertical axis is then the expansion rate of the universe at that time. So the dashed black lines there show the two current best estimates we have of the current rate of expansion now from measuring it with supernova and nearby galaxies and then from the cosmic microwave background. The blue curve shows how the expansion rate changes over time in our current best model of the universe, Lambda CDM. So that's everything we currently know about the universe, right? So the fact that it has cold dark matter and that it does expand, but it also accelerates in expansion as well. Whereas the purple and the green lines show two of Zagetti and collaborators' simple models of the universe as just a rotating fluid one at a slower rate and one at a faster rate. There's then these two little zoom in panels that show in more detail what's happening at early and late times in the universe's history. So the left hand one shows that early times when the cosmic microwave background was emitted, the models all roughly agree. But the panel on the right that zooms into what's happening today shows how the Lambda CDM model, our best current model of the universe, goes to those lower values like what's been reported by the Planck team using the cosmic microwave background. But the rotating models give a higher value of the current expansion rate, a value closer to what's been reported by using supernova to measure the distances to nearby galaxies. So Segeti and collaborators then say, okay, if you assume that that measurement of the Hubble constant using the supernova to measure the distances to nearby galaxies, if you assume that is correct, that measurement, and that is the real proper expansion rate of the universe now today, then in their simple models, how fast does the universe have to be rotating to give you that same value? And they find that if they do that, the universe has to be spinning with an angular velocity of 0.002 per giga year, i.e. it's rotating once every 500 billion years. And interestingly, Segeti and collaborators point out that's right on the edge of what's maximally allowed in their models, like the maximum spin that the universe could have, which is shown by the red shaded regions on this plot here. Any faster and you start to get weird effects like time looping back on itself and all logic just gets thrown out of the window. Segeti and collaborators even comment on this, stating, most remarkably, the allowed maximal rotation is approximately the same as the one required to solve the Hubble puzzle. Which is an interesting coincidence, but how much should we read into this? It would help if we could actually prove that the universe is spinning. Because let's be clear here, this is not an observation of the universe nor is it a fully analytical model either. It doesn't consider gravity or any other of the laws of physics. It's not a realistic model. It's just a very simple toy model. One that the authors actually have to assume is true first to then prove that it works. It's what we call a fine-tuned model. And just because it seems to have solved the problem doesn't mean that it is actually the correct solution to the problem. We still need some observational evidence to back this up, to back up the idea that the universe is actually spinning. So how do we do that? Well, ideally you'd observe this directly and observe the spinning itself. What that would mean is that over time we would see objects just shifting on the sky. For example, our nearest galaxy Andromeda would shift a tiny amount either to the left or to the right, up or down over time. But if the universe spun at a rate of say, once every 500 billion years, then the amount that Andromeda would shift in say a decade or two or a few would be absolutely tiny, like way smaller than we'd be able to detect with the current generation of telescopes. Going to bigger distances would help because the amount an object would shift would appear larger to us, but then the objects also appear smaller, so detecting small shifts when they only take up a few pixels on our telescope detectors is nigh on impossible. So with that idea out, instead what we could do is try and find evidence for the universe spinning that is 
indirect evidence, so observing the subsequent effects of a spinning universe on the objects within it. For example, if the universe is spinning, that would mean that as galaxies form from clouds of gas, those gas clouds are more likely to start spinning in the same direction as the universe does, resulting in more galaxies that spin one way compared to another. But the Galaxy Zoo team already looked at this back in 2008 with this paper by Landon collaborators, and they found no preference for rotation one way or the other. Okay, so another thing we could look at is how the galaxies are distributed across the sky, because if the universe is spinning, then it should be different in different directions. But it's not. The universe, as far as we can tell, is both isotropic, the same in all directions, and homogeneous, the same at any position. This is currently one of the fundamental ideas that underpins the entirety of cosmology. It's known as the Copernican principle, which I've covered in a video before, which I'll link below. Okay, so another thing we could look out for instead is evidence in the cosmic microwave background. This relic of the early universe that records information about the soup of matter that it was at that time. Because if the universe is spinning, then it should be spinning around an axis, which should give you differences on one side of the sky to another, and you should be able to see it in the cosmic microwave background. And that's the big question, because there's been a claim of a preferred axis in the cosmic microwave background, dubbed the axis of evil. But there's still a big debate over whether it's real or not. And it seems to line up with the axis of rotation of the solar system which suggests to most people that it isn't a real effect that we're seeing, and it's actually some observational bias from the solar system's movement that we haven't taken into account. If you want more information on that, I've already made a video on the axis of evil, which again, I'll link to below. So, as intriguing as this idea is of a spinning universe, and as convincing as this toy model of Segeti and collaborators is, we still have no observational evidence to support the idea that the universe spins. So with no evidence, we assume that it doesn't. What we need is new ideas for ways we can try and observe the effects of a spinning universe. And then we need a proper cosmological, mathematical model of a realistic spinning and expanding universe that we can test those observations against. Which means, it's time to knuckle down and do some science. It's necessarily, necessarily, I don't know what happened there. Which, you know, which you know, could be you. There is a helicopter going over, hang on. Apparently, more planes go over on a Tuesday than on a Friday when I normally film. In particular, the mathematician Court Girdle in 1940 now no, 1940 noun. How did I get girdle right and then do 1949 wrong? So in this video, we're gonna do a, do oh, there is a fly on my foot. Oh, I thought that, <laughs> I thought it was like a cable from one of my lights just tickling me and I was like, no, it's a fly. I don't know where it went. I think I killed it. I need Pip to come and get it. That's what she's good for at the minute. It's <laughs> spiders and flies. 